morning and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, to our worship celebrations. A special welcome to any visitors and newcomers joining us today. It is our hope that you experience the love of Christ this morning and his presence during our worship. If you have no church home, we warmly welcome you to the community of faith here at Clearly. The sacrament of Holy Communion will be celebrated this morning. All are invited to the Lord's table. If you are worshiping online, please prepare your elements of bread and wine in order to partake. Next Sunday, July 17th, all are welcome to join us as we recognize elder, our elder Mary Janet Vandenberg's service to our church as she retires from session. <clears throat> Excuse me. For all other announcements, please refer to our news flash. Thank you. Let me say, friends, how good it is to see all of you today. I've been away for a few weeks, but I'm back and in good health. I still feel, I sound like I know I have a frog in my throat, but I feel just fine now. And it's good to worship the Lord together. Would you join me, if you're able, stand please, and let's sing Holy, Holy, Holy. valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us worship God as we sing hymn number 65, All People That on Earth Do Dwell.
lift up our hearts to the Lord. Let's pray. O oh, everlasting God, send out your light and your truth into our lives. Let them lead us today because your son Jesus is the light of the world. Your son Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. Looking for Jesus, we want to find him. And looked for by Jesus, we want him to find us first. Almighty God, nothing we do can make us seek, make, make you seek us or love us any less. Nothing we do can make you seek us or love us any more than you already do. You seek us with all the passion of a lover. And so we come to worship and adore you. Open us, Lord, to your living presence this morning, that you might create a river of joy in our hearts, a river of joy and gladness that overflows with gratitude toward you and with blessing toward others. So, Lord, we would receive your blessing upon us today, enliven our faith, raise our hope, warm our love, and fill us with your spirit today as we receive from your word and your table. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's read together our prayer of confession. Holy God, we are not meant to live life alone. We need you and the community of the church. Forgive us when we try to go it alone, when we think we can handle it all without any help, when we forget to rely on one another and on you. We need you and our brothers and sisters in Christ to live a faithful life. Help us to reach out to each other and to you, remembering that a strand of three cords is not easily broken. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear friends, it says in God's word that if we claim we have no sin, then we're just deceiving ourselves. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and cleanses us from anything that we've done that's wrong. So why don't we just take a moment, having confessed our sins, to receive afresh the forgiveness of God. Because of what Jesus has done for you, you can approach God as a much-loved child, as a much-loved daughter, as a much-loved son, and know that he welcomes you with great love today. Amen, and thanks be to God for his love. And with that assurance of God's peace and knowing that we are his children, uh, we can extend that peace to one another. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Would you extend that peace to one another? Turn and greet your neighbor in Jesus' name. And peace to you, Allison, and peace online church family and Patricia. As morning, dawn, and evening fades, a beautiful praise song. Let's stand together as we sing. As morning dawns and evening fades, you inspire songs of praise that rise from earth and glorify your name. Your name is a strong and mighty tower. Your name is a shelter like no other. Your name, let the nation sing it louder, because nothing has the power to 
some children at heart, not too many. <laughs> but friends, I, wanna, I want to uh, just say a word about something that's very precious and special that's happening uh, within the boundaries of our church building and in our parking lot for the next six weeks. Um, Urban Promise, which is a Christian ministry to young people, especially vulnerable young people, is putting on a camp right here at Clarely Park Presbyterian Church. Um, it's the Wardenwood Scarborough neighborhood, but the camp will be occurring from July 11th, that's tomorrow, all the way until August 19th. For those weeks, Monday to Friday, our parking lot and our basement will be used by uh, the staff of Urban Promise as they seek to reach out with God's love to young people and children in our community. I have a photograph here of our illustrious clerk of session, Joyce Donaldson, uh, with some of the staff members from Urban Promise who will be leading the camp. And I'll suggest a few points for prayer, but then afterwards I'm going to come down to Helen, and Helen, I'm going to give this to you, and we'll just pass that picture around throughout the church, so don't worry, you won't be rude if you need to get up and give it to the person behind you. But I want you to see the faces of the team that will be sharing the love of Jesus with children in the next six weeks under the auspices of Urban Promise and our own Clarely Park Presbyterian Church. We want to be remembering in particular staff members. Julius is the community director. Aisha and Ashley are the supervisors. Enrico, Lexi, Matthias, and Mia are the program directors. And they will be ministering to children creatively through games, through crafts, through learning, through study, through activities, through prayer. 
and they mention Urban Promise does that they are grateful to partner with Clarely Park Presbyterian Church to host our summer camp. They have no, they have named this camp Camp Hope. Camp Hope. What a wonderful name! So here's the picture of the here's the picture of the staff. And here's the prayer bulletin, and I'll be sure to make copies of this prayer bulletin so that those of you next week, if you're here, you can pick this up and remember to pray for those uh, for the camp. But let's do that right now. Gracious God, thank you that all property is your property. Well, it's clearly Park Presbyterian Church, but Lord, it's yours. This is... This is kingdom work, and we are so grateful to be sharing our facilities with Urban Promise as they reach out with your love to children and young people who need to hear and know and be assured that you love them too. So bless the work of Urban Promise in these weeks to come at camp. Keep everyone safe. May it be a meaningful time. May many grow and come to know your love in a deep and a personal way this summer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And before the message, we'll be hearing an anthem. Well, the words are taken from Acts 2. We're going through the book of Acts, and this is a wonderful reminder. The music was composed by Karen, and it's sung by Jonah. in which we could go home right now because we've just heard the sermon. <laughs> Everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Boy, if you don't remember anything else about church today, remember that, and that's the heart, isn't it? What are we devoted to? Two 
young parents looked down at their sleeping newborn baby, the baby that they had just brought home from the hospital. They'd fixed up the nursery. They'd read all the latest parenting books. They had stocked their closet full of gadgets for the baby. But none of that preparation seemed adequate as they thought about the road ahead. Looking down into that baby crib, the new father looked up at the new mother and said, Now what do we do? <laughs> now what do we do? Because it was all a bit overwhelming. Late night feedings and doctor's visits and mountains of diapers to change. And then there'd be learning to walk and, and putting up with the temper tantrums and helping their child learn to ride their bicycle and accompanying her to her first day of school. For these young parents, the question, now what do we do, was a very excellent question. Maybe you've been there. Well, friends, you know, the apostles and the leaders in the early church must have asked that very same question or something like it. Because after the day of Pentecost, based on that song that Jonah just sung, the words when Peter got up and preached his message that Jesus Christ is the Lord and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, do you know what happened on Pentecost? Do you remember? That was a few weeks ago. So those who welcomed Peter's message, says Acts 2.41, were baptized and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They welcomed Peter's message of new life in Christ. They responded by repenting and believing and being baptized and 3,000 were added to the church. Now, not a church with a building like this, with a pulpit and pews, but God's universal family of faith. God designed his church to provide protection and nourishment and growth for its members through family relationships. And in this way, the church is like a spiritual incubator, providing warmth and encouragement for these new young believers to grow up in Christ. But you see, friends, these newborn believers, these new Christians, needed to learn how to walk with Jesus and live by faith. They needed to learn how to worship and how to pray and how to, how to grow in their faith, how to handle temptation and times of testing. The apostles did not have an instruction manual to follow an, a first century equivalent of a baby book how would they nurture and help these little ones? How would the infant church survive and grow? Now what do we do? Well, in the passage that Denise read for us, Luke tells us what the first Christians were devoted to. Do you read that verse? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. That word devoted means a single-minded faithfulness to a certain course of action, the highest priorities of their life together. So what were they devoted to? Well, their first priority was to the apostles' teaching. In other words, they, they were a learning church. It was as if the Holy Spirit had opened a school in Jerusalem that day and the teachers were the apostles that Jesus had appointed and now there were 3,000 students who just enrolled. And what was it the apostles taught? Well, surely they used the Old Testament scriptures along with the words and the teachings and the message of Jesus to feed the people. The apostles were like spiritual pediatricians, nourishing new believers with teaching from God's word, like milk for a baby. 
You know, friends, a diet that neglects the Bible produces weak Christians who are unable to handle trials and temptations in life. Instead, as the Apostle Peter puts it in one of his letters, like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow up into salvation. Since the teaching of the apostles has come down to us in the writings of the New Testament, that's what the New Testament is, the memories and the recollections and the teachings of our Lord Jesus as recorded by those who knew him, that means that the writings of the New Testament to be devoted today to the apostles' teaching is to learn to live by and apply the teaching of the New Testament in our daily lives. In other words, a spirit-filled church is always going to be a Bible-studying church. Those two things go together, word and spirit. The closer men and women come to God, the closer they want to, to get to where God speaks to their hearts. We want to hear God's voice. He's our Father. We're His sons and daughters. And God speaks primarily through the Bible. Through the Bible, God speaks to us so we can know Him better and to do what God wants us to do. So the very first mark of a spirit-filled church is a place where the Bible is heard and taught and learned, where we are growing in our knowledge of Scripture, devoted to studying and applying the Bible in our lives so that we can follow Jesus more faithfully and more completely. Well, the second thing Luke tells us about the community of believers is that they were a loving church. They devoted themselves to, what was the next word? Fellowship. Fellowship. The word in Greek is koinonia, or koinonia, depending on how you, where you put the emphasis on the right syllable, <laughs> which, means, which means having something in common. Sharing, sharing something together. The one thing that the Christians all shared together was their common faith in Jesus Christ. Their fellowship manifested itself in two ways. They shared in their common experiences together as brothers and sisters in Christ in times of joy and sorrow. And they shared with one another they shared their material gifts, as well as words of love and encouragement. The fellowship they shared together was an expression of vibrant, authentic Christianity in action. You know, friends, we have tasted in this little Clarely Park Presbyterian Church, we've tasted that same sweet kind of fellowship in our congregation as well. But friends, as Ann Ortland writes in one of her books, um, it's a choice. Fellowship is a choice. Ann says this, every congregation has a choice to be one of two things. You can choose to be a bag of marbles, single units that don't affect each other except in collision, on Sunday morning, you can choose to go to church or to sleep in. Who cares whether you're 192 or 193 marbles in a bag <laughs> bumping into each other? Or, says Anne, you can choose to be a bag of grapes, soft, mushy, sweet grapes. The juices begin to mingle, especially when the bag gets jostled around a bit. And there's no way to extricate yourselves if you tried. Each one has become a part of all the others. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a marble. I want to be like those grapes. I want sweet fellowship in our church. And Acts 2 also teaches us that the first believers were generous with their possessions. Now hear me carefully, friends. In the Bible, there is nothing wrong with owning personal property. The Bible isn't Marxism. 
But their love for one another overflowed so much that they gave to others as any had need. The first believer's financial problems were not automatically solved because they had become Christians. There were, of course, there were still needy people. But because of this radical spirit of sharing and of giving, they didn't have to remain needy because the church took care of one another in their times of need. The early believers loved one another. This was a gift the Holy Spirit poured out into them. In that infant church in Jerusalem, they had a new desire to meet together and help each other. Luke tells us they were devoted to the fellowship. They continued to meet together. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts. There was a new release of finances and generosity and giving. A spirit-filled church will be a united church, a church with love, not only for the Lord, but for one another. So it was a learning church, it was a loving church, and thirdly, it was a worshiping church. They devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now usually when we talk about breaking bread together, we mean getting together with our friends at our homes or at a restaurant for a meal. And sharing meals together was also a part of the life of the early church. It says in verse 46 that they spent time together in one another's homes. And we should do the same, eating and sharing and laughing together. But this phrase, the breaking of bread, is a reference to celebrating the Lord's Supper, which Jesus asked his followers to do. You know, just before his death, Jesus held that Passover meal with his friends, the disciples, with bread and wine. And after thanking God, he broke the bread into pieces and gave it to them and said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You see, by regularly coming to communion, we are doing what Jesus asked us to do. We are, we are remembering him, keeping our hearts focused on Christ. In the Lord's Supper, we're being fed at the family table, at God's family table. As the Lord offers us his very life, his body and his blood, he renews our faith. He gives us the gift of eternal life. Every time we remember that Jesus died for me and for you, we receive him again into our hearts by faith. Receiving the Lord's Supper is spiritual therapy for our burdened souls. It's like coming back home to a loving home after a difficult or a long day. We're surrounded again by Christ's love. We're offered refreshment and renewal, peace and purpose to keep going. Now friends, we don't know exactly how the early Christians celebrated communion together. The Bible doesn't describe it, certainly in this part of the book of Acts. Was it somber and reflective? Was it joyful and celebratory? Well, I imagine it was both. I think worship in the early church was both joyful and reverent. I'm sure worship in the early church was exuberant and joyful because God had sent his son into the world and now he'd sent his Holy Spirit and poured out upon them. And I dare say we could use some of that uninhibited joy in our worship which is the fruit of God's Spirit. Well, I am so glad to see some of my dear brothers and sisters who used to be with me at Knox Church, because you'll remember this. When I was a minister at Knox Church downtown, one of our senior members there, one of our elders, in fact, was a man named Charles Huggins. Mr. Huggins was from the island of Nevis in the Caribbean. And in the middle of my sermons, when Charles particularly appreciated something I said, he would let out with an amen. And it was about that loud. At least it sounded that way to me up in the pulpit. I was always surprised when Charles gave an amen. But 
But more than that, I was always encouraged. I was encouraged. And that's what every worship service should be for us. It should lift our spirits. It should encourage us. You know, that word in, encourage means to, to be filled with courage, strengthened, renewed hope. Worship should do that because we are joyfully celebrating all the great things God has done for us in Christ. But at the same time, just as joyful worship is a gift from God, so is awe and wonder and reverence. Verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe. God was at work in their midst. This was something that took their breath away. God was in their midst and they knew it. And so they bowed down in humility and in wonder. They undoubtedly valued silent adoration as well as exuberant praise. In their communion with the living God, the early church's worship was full of reverence and rejoicing. Awe and joy, dignity and warmth. And that's the healthy balance we should seek as we worship the Lord together. There's one more thing we read about in the book of Acts chapter 2. The first Christians emphasized prayer. The Greek says literally they were continually devoting themselves to the prayers. That may be a reference to the prayers that were happening in the temple in Jerusalem as well as prayers when they gathered together as believers. But it implies that they prayed persistently, both when they were together and when they were apart. They prayed when they gathered for worship, and they prayed when they scattered to their homes. Prayer was a priority because it kindled a personal involvement with one another and sparked a desire to serve and love the Lord. They listened to each other and cared for each other in the most profound way by praying for one another. We can experience this same kind of kindling effect when we pray with and for one another. You know, we could choose to isolate ourselves, become like a charred ember that falls away from the rest of the fire, and soon that ember left by itself will grow dark and cold. But when we join with others in prayer, when we join praying for others, we glow with an enthusiasm to serve the Lord and reflect His radiance. I certainly felt that in a peculiar way this last Thursday night as we lifted up our congregation in our Zoom prayer meeting. So friends, what have we learned? We've learned about the church in Acts 2, that they were devoted to learning God's word, loving God's people, worshiping from their hearts, praying continually. Luke is painting a picture for us of what it means to follow Jesus. But if we stopped there, we'd be missing on something vital. All these elements that we mentioned describe the interior life of the church, they tell us nothing about the first believer's compassionate outreach to the world. Verse 47 tells us, And the Lord, what? Added to their number daily those who were being saved. Those first Christians weren't so preoccupied with learning and loving and worshiping and praying that they forgot about sharing with others witnessing to their faith in Christ. Moved by God's Spirit, they were an evangelistic church sharing the good news about Jesus with others. How could they do anything else? In the life and ministry of Jesus, they had experienced the healing and the grace and the power of God. Some of them had been present when Jesus had died on the cross. Many of them were eyewitnesses to His resurrection. Now that God's Spirit had been poured out, they had a life-transforming message to share. 
They had to tell other people. How could they not? So as a result, it says in verse 47, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Notice it says they were added how often? Daily, frequently, on a regular basis. Some churches have an annual evangelistic campaign or an occasional gospel sermon, but the clear emphasis here is not a, one of sporadic, irregular activity, but continuous, ongoing outreach. Just as their worship was daily, so was their witness. And both were a natural overflow of hearts filled with the Holy Spirit. So friends, how do we measure up here at Clarely Park Church? What are we devoted to? Or as those parents said, now what do we do? How are we doing at learning God's word? At loving God's people? At worshiping the Lord from our hearts? Praying continually? And sharing Christ's love with others? Dear friends, let's humble ourselves before the Lord and ask for God's Spirit to come in a new and fresh way into our lives and into our congregation to manifest these marks of His presence in our midst. Let's pray. Come Holy Spirit and bless the worship and work of this congregation that we may be a house of prayer, a center of Christian teaching, a community of service, and a witness to your redeeming love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Friends, the psalmist says, let us give thanks to the Lord with all our being, praising God for the blessings and goodness we have received. Let's stand as we sing the doxology together.
Could you please be seated now, and we'll be singing together this hymn of preparation, Here is Bread, Here is Wine, number 546. Let's hear again the story of how this sacrament, this meal, began. On the night on which Jesus was betrayed, he sat at supper with his disciples. While they were eating, he took a piece of bread and said a blessing and broke it and gave it to them with the words, This is my body which is for you. Do this to remember me. Later he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed with my blood. Drink from it, all of you, to remember me. So now following Jesus' example and command, we take this bread and this cup, the ordinary things of this world, which Christ will use for extraordinary purposes. And as the Lord, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and offered thanksgiving to God, so now we would offer our thanks and our praise to the Lord. And I invite you to use the wording in our hymn book of, from the book of praise 564 for the words of our liturgy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give you thanks and praise. O gracious and merciful God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, it is always right, it is always good to lift up our hearts to praise your name. Almighty and eternal God, we praise you for the majesty of your glory, for the wonder of your works, for the, the beauty of creation for the riches of your grace. Therefore, we join with all heaven and earth to lift our hearts in joyful praise. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, who, who lived our human life and knew our joys and our sorrows. He showed your love. He healed the sick. He was a friend to sinners. In obedience to you, 
He took up His cross and died in love for us and for the world. You raised Him from the dead to live and reign forever. And He is still a friend of sinners, the one who prays and intercedes for us before Your very throne in heaven, the one who feeds us at this table. Today, O oh Lord, we, we again proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and these gifts of bread and wine that we may know Christ's presence, real and true. We offer, Lord, and present our very selves to you to be living sacrifices, ready and fit to serve you. Remember, Lord, your holy church throughout the world. Reveal your glory to the nations. Save your people and bless those who belong to you. Shepherd them and carry them forever. Remember, Lord, our family and our friends. Surround them with your steadfast love. Remember, Lord, especially today those who are sick within our own church family. For Betty Maddow and hospital for a number of our members with COVID, for Tom and Beatrice Cleary, and Jim and Jean McGowan, and Irene Livingston, and Letitia Nicholas's daughters and her son-in-law. Lord, we lift up those who suffer pain or loneliness or grief today, those who are drawing near to death, those whom we name in our hearts before you now in silence. Comfort them with your presence. Sustain them with your promises. Grant them your peace. With all your people on earth and in heaven, unite us with Christ and help us to remain faithful with hope and love. Gather your whole church, Lord, into the glory of your kingdom. And friends, now let us sing together as we pray the prayer Jesus taught his followers to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. there is one loaf, we as many as we are, are one body, for it is one loaf that we all share together. When we break the bread, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? And when we give thanks for the cup, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Christ given for you. Sorry. 
this week to love and to serve the Lord and be ready to receive whatever he wants to give you and do whatever he says for you to do. And receive now his blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon you and upon all those you love today and forevermore. Amen. Amen.